Hi everyone, my name is Kinya Ota. I have spent more than 10 years studying goldfish development and evolution. Recently, my friend asked me to make detailed videos about goldfish development and evolution. So I have decided to produce this video series based on my papers and book. We will explore goldfish evodivo. In this episode, I will explain the historical background of goldfish. This will be helpful in considering the evolutionary developmental biology of goldfish. Goldfish are one of the most popular ornamental animals. Their highly diverged shape and the colorations are quite popular. Interestingly, all of these diverged uh, strains belong to a crucian carp species, Calasius auratus. These various goldfish strains have been established from the Calasius auratus species by breeders and fanciers during the domestication process. But how did the Calasius species interact with humans just before the domestication began? We will first explore this point. A recent zooarchaeological study said the early Neolithic people cultured fish species. They especially prefer the common carp, Cyprinus carupio. The common carp is known as one of the closely related fish to Calasius species that Neolithic people could easily access to the Calasius species, but they tend to consume common carp as a food. This means that the Neolithic people culturally really prefer the common carp and they finally established a functional aquaculture system for common carp. It is also known that an important script about the common carp aquaculture was also written in ancient China. This script was later cited in several books. This script describes a method that 20 mature females and 4 males are kept in the same pond. To me, personally, the strange thing is why there are no similar description of Calasius species. Simply my survey is insufficient or truly the ancient Chinese people really like the common cup, I don't know. But the important point is that these fish species were recognized as food, not ornamental fish. Perhaps agriculture and the associated irrigation system were compatible with the farming of these fish, just as the fish are kept for food in pond today, people in the past would have kept fish in the pond. However, the situation changed slightly in the Tang Dynasty. During the Tang Dynasty period, there was a growing cultural motivation to intensively maintain color mutant goldfish. This era was significant for goldfish domestication and was largely influenced by Buddhism. As a symbolic gesture, living creatures were released into ponds known as the Pond of Mashi. The Calasius species with color mutations may have also been recognized as special creatures with mysterious significance. And the situation is even more different in the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty marks a significant period in history of goldfish domestication. From this point on, people started building private ponds specifically for the purpose of keeping only goldfish for viewing. Private goldfish pond and the pond of mercy totally different in the community of kept organisms. In the pond of mercy, people released different types of animals including some other fish and the turtles. Goldfish have to compete with these animals. But in the private goldfish pond, goldfish do not have to compete with other animals. And in the Ming dynasty even more so, the situation changed. During the Ming Dynasty, particularly the late Ming Dynasty, there was significant development in goldfish breeding. Goldfish were kept in basins or aquariums. This caused significant differences in goldfish domestication compared to outdoor ponds. 
The smaller water volumes and the more controlled environment of aquarium cultures required more attention, which resulted in changes to the selective pressure on goldfish. Moreover, in the book Traces on Natural Beauties, there are detailed descriptions of sophisticated breeding methods for goldfish. According to the translation by Chen, 1954, this book said, after raining, put the breeding fish with the water grass into a new vessel of clear water. When you see the male fish chasing after and biting the female along the wall of the vessel, you know that it is time. When the biting is over, put the fish back into the old vessel. Examine the water grass in the light of sun. If you find little crystalline granules about the size of a millet, they are the eggs. Then put the water grass in the shallow earthen pot. From this text, we can infer that the goldfish breeders at the time were able to perform one to one genetic cross in their aquarium system. This method is a significant difference in the comparison with the random mating between multiple adult fish in the pond. This is an important point in the history of goldfish domestication as it allows breeders selectively control the genetic trait of the fish and establish new and unique varieties. So, based on my current knowledge, the Son to Min dynasties are recognized as important periods for the establishment of ornamental goldfish. New varieties have emerged over a very short period of time, just several hundred years. In other words, it is possible that these morphological changes occurred extremely fast compared to the time it takes for morphological evolution to occur in nature, and from the middle to modern ages, these ornamental strains of goldfish have been kept and spread worldwide. This video is based on my book, and my knowledge of goldfish domestication history depends on these early studies. I provide the detail of these studies. Please check the descriptions below. But history is a constantly updated field, and as research progresses, we may discover new information about the history of goldfish breeding. So, if you have any information, Please give me your comments. We have mainly focused on the history of goldfish breeding. From now on, I would like to talk about the early history of evolution and developmental biology of goldfish. From the Ming Dynasty onwards, people from the West began to actively come to China, and various goldfish strains were introduced to Western society. With the spread of these goldfish varieties, scientists at the beginning of the evolutionary studies observed the different types of goldfish. The unique morphologies of ornamental goldfish have fascinated two of the most influential early biologists. Charles Darwin and William Bateson. Darwin used ornamental goldfish variations to support his idea of gradual change in animal trait in his book. He described almost all of the mutated goldfish morphologies. Similarly, Bateson introduced twin tail goldfish in his monograph. He cited a goldfish study by a Japanese scientist. Watase shows up below. Watase reported a detailed description of the morphology of the twin tail goldfish. Bateson used the twin tail goldfish as a representative example of discontinuous variations and protested against Darwin's gradual evolution. Since the aim of this series is to introduce goldfish evo devo, I will also discuss how these three early scientists viewed not only evolution but also developmental biology. Although Darwin and Bateson were fascinated by the unique morphologies of various goldfish strains, their focus seems to be on adult goldfish. They did not mention the embryonic and larval development of goldfish in their works on evolutionary biology. So it is quite likely that 
Bateson knew about the description of goldfish development by Watase. However, the embryonic and larval development were not highlighted by Bateson. I don't know why exactly, but I assume that it might not have been clear to him how to incorporate the detailed description of time-dependent morphological change of goldfish embryos into his arguments. Despite their differences in research topics and conclusions, Darwin, Watase, and Bateson all of these scientists knew that the value of observing goldfish phenotypes that had been selected and genetically fixed by breeders to gain useful insights into natural evolutionary processes. Perhaps some of you have also been intrigued by the fascinating variety of goldfish just like the early scientists who studied goldfish morphology and development. I have also been fascinated by how goldfish varieties develop from fertilized eggs. This is why I decided to focus my studies on goldfish. To learn more about the characteristics of goldfish, we will discuss taxonomy, phylogeny, and genomic features in the next episode. It is time to say goodbye. I hope you learned something new about goldfish development and evolution from this episode. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel to catch the next episode. See you soon.